As far as the main project objectives in controlling the angular velocity of a DC motor, this is a typical DC motor that will be given to each group. This DC motor consists of three main parts. So we have the DC motor, which is this part. We have the gearing section. This is used to amplify the output torque of the DC motor. And the last part is the encoder. This is your sensor. So the encoder converts the information from one format into another. Same way your speaker converts an electrical signal into music, this electromechanical device converts the angular position of your DC motor shaft into an electronic signal. This encoder output signal is fed into a microcontroller that controls your application and provide real-world data to make better programming decisions. Mainly there are two types of encoders. We have the absolute encoders and we have the relative encoders. The absolute encoders, they can actually give you the actual angle or position of your motor shaft. For example, the output of an absolute encoder could be I-20 degrees. And the absolute encoders, they maintain the position information even if power is removed. Whereas the relative encoders, which are also referred to as incremental encoders, relative encoders provide information about the motion of your DC motor shaft in a both direction and angular velocity. So the relative encoder can detect whether your motor is in clockwise or counterclockwise position in addition to the angular velocity as well. Normally the absolute encoders are large, complicated and more expensive than the relative encoders. The relative encoders they could be optical or magnetic. In our case, it will be a magnetic encoder where the magnet, which is shown as a black disc here, I'll use different color. So this black disc is attached to the shaft of the motor. And there are two hole effect sensors side by side as shown here. This is one hole effect sensor. This is the other one are used to detect the changing magnetic field as the shaft rotates. If you notice that in the middle, the motor shaft extends to the back of your uh, encoder and the disc rotates with the DC motor shaft. Normally, the whole effect sensors are positioned at 90 degrees. And they are called channel A and channel B. Let's put a different color. In our case, each channel will give you 11 pulses per revolution which is sometimes denoted as pulse per revolution also channel B will give you the same pulses per revolution for that specific encoder let's put this one back more clear Thus, 
11 pulses. Now remember these 11 pulses per revolution. What we mean by revolution is the revolution of your DC motor shaft. And remember that the DC motor shaft RPM is not the same as is not the same as the wheel RPM. For example, let's assume that the gear ratio is 1 to 75 what does that mean that the DC motor runs 75 revolutions for the wheel to run once ie for one wheel revolution this will lead to the 75 which is the gearing ratio multiplied by 11 pulses this equals to 825 pulses per wheel revolution So keep this in mind when you calculate the actual DC motor output RPM. So if you just gain some space here. A typical output from channel A and B may look like this. So if we consider uh, channel A here, uh, you may get a low, then you get a pulse. These pulses dependent on the magnetic disk rotation. Now, because the uh, channel B is located at 90 degrees, so um, there's always a difference in time between channel A and channel B. So let's assume we have this scenario. So please keep in mind that as the motor rotates, one sensor will see the change before the other. For example, when the motor shaft rotates clockwise, channel A will lead. That means the channel A edge will rise before channel B. And that's why we have this offset due to the 90 degree uh, location of the whole effect. And when the motor spins counterclockwise, channel A will lag. That means channel A will rise after channel B. The question is, what if we have only one whole effect sensor instead of two? If we have one whole effect sensor involved, then it would still be possible to measure the number of rotations, but we will not be able to detect the direction of the motor. It's important to highlight that when the encoder signal is decoded by the microcontroller, it's possible that you only count the rising signal on a single channel. So you could only use channel A on its own and you just count the rising signal. Now to increase the resolution further, you can not only measure the rising edges, but you can also measure the rising edges and 
the falling edges of both channels A and B. In this case, you are improving the resolution by four times. And this is why sometimes these encoders are referred to as the quadrature encoders. But how you will be wiring this encoder to your Arduino and the H-bridge? Let's go over pin by pin just to make sure you don't damage the encoder. So if I copy the, um, the coloring of these wires, so we have the first one is the red, the second one is the black, we have the yellow, we have the green, we have the blue, and we have the white ones. which I will use simple text to write white so we have the white the DC motor that will be supplied to the students will be a 6 volts motor in this case the red wire since it is leading to M1 that will be the plus 6 And the white wire will be the negative terminal of your power supply. The black wire. Now the blue wire is your encoder power supply and it should be between 3 to um, 5 volts maximum. And the black one is the negative of your encoder supply and the yellow wire goes to the C1 so if we consider B1 in yellow so if we consider this is a yellow so we can consider this is the C1 and the green one will be the C2 which is shown as channel 8 So this is B. So as discussed, these are simply output pulses due to the revolutions.